My name is Josh Bernstein. I am a Brooklyn-based journalist and author. And I've been writing about beer, food, spirits, and travel in New York City for about, gosh, 12 years now. And that really wasn't my original career trajectory. I didn't really end up wanting to come to New York City to be a writer. But after I graduated college, I went on a road trip across country. And then it was one of those failed collegiate road trips. I ended up getting dropped off in the middle of Great Falls, Montana, and which was really poetic first day of fall. So being 21 years old, I was like, this is awesome. And so the rest of my life is in front of me, but I didn't really know what to do. And so I had two choices. I could call friends in, who was it? They're in Albuquerque and friends in Boulder. So my friends in Boulder picked up the phone first, so I went there for a few weeks. But living in someone's basement, drinking beer all day long is awesome, but also not really a great career path. And so my friend in New York City called me up, and he's like, Josh, we got a spare bedroom in Astoria. Do you want to come live there for free for two months? And I was like, sure. So I got on a bus, traveled across country, and then got to Astoria, and then I didn't really know what I was going to do either. I went to school, I had a magazine journalism degree, but that doesn't really, that doesn't really mean anything at all. It really means you graduated from college, and then as I quickly found out, a journalism degree didn't really matter worth a darn in New York. I went to Ohio University, which, you know, is supposed to be a prestigious journalism school, but in New York, people are just like, I don't really care what you did, Ohio boy. And so I tempt. And I tempt and I tempt and I tempt for, gosh, several years. I was a temp receptionist, and I was then, well, backtrack a little bit. Do you want the real story? So basically, <laughs> it's mildly embarrassing, but it's like the foolhardy choices you make when you're in your early 20s. And so I got a job at American Baby magazine for a few months, basically filing papers. And so I was like, journalism, American Baby, this is great. But you know, it wasn't very rewarding at all. And so at the time, my friend um, was working for a porn publishing company. And he was like, Josh, do you want to work at this porn publishing company as an editor? And I was like, I was like, why the hell not? I'm 22 years old. So <laughs> I spent the next eight months working for a porn publisher, which, I mean, the initial hilarity of it all kind of fell away. I mean, the job was built upon three parts. One was about, um, there was a magazine, Hot Chocolate and Cuddles. One was young black girls. One was young white girls. So I was in charge of interviewing porn stars. And then the other part was there was all these books called chat books, like basically five and a half by eight and a half black and white newsprint books filled with all this really terrible writing about porn. And my job was to go through them all and modernize it. I mean, it was thematically oriented, like horny housewives, naughty neighbors, family secrets, terrible, terrible, terrible stuff. And so it was my job all day long to modernize it and also find the pictures that go with it. And so after about, <laughs> which, I mean, this was a really terrible job back then. I mean, I was getting paid, it was like 15 bucks an hour, but I was like, I'm making it, 15 bucks an hour. But I mean, you'd be in this small office with like eight people, then this run by a Caribbean woman, she'd want to come and hug you, and you'd have to review porn on VHS in her office. And it was just really wrong in so many ways. But then <laughs> it took me a while. I, did, I didn't really realize it, I mean, how wrong it was. But then after, uh, our offices were below Canal Street on Broadway. Then after 9-11, basically, we couldn't go to work for two weeks. So I came back to work. And then my boss was like, oh, it sucks. We couldn't go to work. Well, let's take out your vacation time. And I was like, oh, my vacation time? I mean, like there was this natural disaster. Everything terrible happened. And it was my vacation time because we were obviously you know, drinking pina coladas all day long when this was happening. And so I started looking for other jobs. My boss found my resume computer. Then I came back from work, from lunch one day. And then all my files were wiped off. And I was like, I'm not going to get fired from a porn job. And so she called me into her office, so I quit. Right then, got my two weeks notice there. She gave me a severance check. So kind of from that moment forward, I was like, you know what? I'm really going to make the writing happen. So I started temping. Like, I was the world's worst receptionist, making like 10 bucks an hour, answering phones, wearing the same tie all day long. But then I was kind of on trying to pitch magazines, newspapers. No one cared. But I really started thinking what I was really passionate about. I've always been a big, um, I've always loved food, always been adventuring in the city to try to find delicious stuff. And I also love going to bars. And so after pitching New York Press, which was an alt weekly that unfortunately expired last year for a number of years, they gave me a weekly column where I got to write about my food and drink adventures in New York. And so that led to working for Time Out New York as their bar reviewer. Then like slowly, bit by bit by bit, I started getting more and more and more gigs. So working for Gourmet as their beer writer, um, the magazine in Portland called Imbibe, they hired me to be their beer writer. And so my career track kind of slowly, steadily started like going into getting drunk and writing about it, which wasn't exactly a bad thing. But then going to bars all night long is really kind of tough and being a reviewer of that. So 
As the days went on, I tried to find a way to kind of having to get out and go out to 4 in the morning because 4 in the morning at 25 is awesome. 4 in the morning at 29 and 30, 31 when you have a wife is just really not as cool as it used to be. And so I kind of started moving into writing more generally about craft beer. And this was maybe about 2005. And, you know, at that time in America, we'd gone through it in the 90s, craft beer, there was this really big push toward craft beer in the 90s, but I mean, there was brands everywhere. Sierra Nevada was really going gangbusters. Dogfish Head came online, all these great breweries, but then everything kind of burst, and everyone thought that this was a big trend that was going away, and that, that craft beer was just another fly-by-night fad. But what started happening in the early 2000s was people came into it with, a much, with much better business plans. Uh, instead of, um, and the market was really flooded with all this extra equipment because everyone that failed had spent all their money on really great equipment and then they didn't need it anymore. And so all these better entrepreneurs bought all this used equipment with a lower barrier to entry. And so craft beer really started taking off all across the country. And so I started writing about it. And then what I, what I soon found about what I really enjoyed about writing about craft beer is that it's, you get an honest story from people. I mean, when I was younger, I used to do celebrity journalism too. You'd have to do dumb stuff like, Stuff that sounds really great, like interviewing Hugh Hefner, the guys from Jackass, which, I mean, ostensibly is a dream thing, but the more I did that, the more I realized that you would never really get true conversations with people, and there was really just a lot of, it was like going into an interview and having, pushing a button, and people would recite everything to you, and it was really disheartening. I mean, as someone that really wanted to talk to people, get great conversations, and tell their stories, it just, it never worked out. And so what I found with craft beer, though, is craft brewing is such a, um, it's such a passionate industry. It's something that's really about, it's your personal, it's DIY, it's blue collar, it's something that everyone does. So people are really proud about it. And the people that are out there doing craft brewing, they're putting everything on the line. I mean, these are people that have found a way to turn their hobby into a career. And it's something they're so incredibly proud of and they want to share their stories. And so you know, what I started realizing was it wasn't as much about the hops, the ABV, you know, the geekiness about these beers, and more really about the people. And so Whenever I decided to write about craft beer, I always think about craft beer, the people behind the beer, behind the beer bottle. And that's really what I started focusing on future-wise. So then the book came about in a totally random way. This publisher, Sterling, I kind of want to write a book, but writing a book and actually doing it are two different things altogether. And you have to pitch people, you have to get queries out there, you have to get publisher interested. I luckily didn't have to do any of that, which I feel entirely lucky. What basically happened was this publisher, Sterling, they were looking to write some, they're looking to hire some beer book authors. And they originally came to me, they found my columns in New York Press, I swear to God, I mean, the guy, the publisher that picked up my Alt Weekly thing, was sitting on like the subway or something and saw my column on there and wrote to me. And like it was as random as that. And then originally they're going to have me do a book about stouts, which, I mean, I mean, it wouldn't be the most exciting thing, but it was really this great opportunity to kind of do a book. But then I was, it's kind of a yes man. I was like, sure, whatever you want me to do. Like, you're going to pay me to be a writer. Like, this is awesome. But the more they thought about that, I mean, with so much change going on in the country and so much change going on in craft beer, that actually writing a book about stouts is really a disservice to what's been happening. And so I came back with another idea. And that was really to tell a story about what's been happening all across the country, traveling from Portland to Portland, small towns in Iowa, Texas, and just talking about the flowering of craft beer and showing how America you know, America, in a way, we don't make a lot of things that, are, that the world cares about anymore. The cars get slagged, electronics, I mean, but craft beer in this really weird way has been something that's been a guiding light for people all around the world that you have, I was on the radio last night with this guy, Yeppi, from, from Denmark, and basically he was totally inspired by American style beers. And so he decided to make it his entire business plan of emulating American beers and making really wild, delicious, flavorful things. And you see this echoed in Norway, you see it echoed in England. And so America, in a great way, is really leading the world with this product that it seems silly and seems frivolous. But what I like about beer is beer brings people together. And that what craft beer does more than anything else. I mean, it used to be you'd go to a bar. If you talk to someone, they'd be like, what do you drink? And like beer. I mean, beer was beer. But now what craft beer is great about, it, I think it really helps people start a conversation because there's so much. And people want to share their passion for it. And craft beer, has such a low barrier to entry, you can spend two bucks and be transported to a really flavorful world. Like the best beer in the world can be bought for two bucks. You can't say that about many other things. Wine, two bucks, I mean, that's two buck chuck, it's a joke. You buy, if you can even buy like two bucks, you'll buy a little airplane bottle of liquor. But I mean, beer, two dollars. And that's the thing about it. It's a great democratizing beverage. And so 
that was it. So I traveled across the country and really told the story of all the brewers, their passion, creativity, and really their struggle to change the way that America drinks one beer at a time. So the beer, the book came out, the book on beer came out at uh, November 2011. So I've been on book tour pretty much for the last 14 months, give or take, which is the one thing that no one ever tells you that when you write a book is that you have to become a salesman, like you stop being a writer and you have to go out and actually those things. So I've had to go there, go to beer festivals, be behind the counter, smiling and hoping people want to want to take a look. But it's really been a totally rewarding ride and it's, you know, I wouldn't give up for anything. It's been really great. And writing a book is not fun. You know, doing the selling is not fun, but it's really excellent is to see the book in people's hands, to see the responses and just get all this great feedback and just, you know, e people emailing me, telling me how they feel about it. That really, it really makes it all worthwhile. Like the year and a half of writing and editing is just, it doesn't feel like anything. So, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. And um, one of the other people we have here today is that the New York craft beer scene is, used to be kind of crappy. I'll be blunt. I mean, there were more craft breweries in the 90s in New York City than there are now. I mean, you had this place called like Nacho Mamas in Soho. There's a brewery in Rockefeller Center. There's even a Times Square brewery. But all these people, they really failed because they were terrible beer, bad business plans. Everything conspired together. And so, I mean, we had Brooklyn Brewery as one of the few leading lights in the city. And then we also had, you know, Six Point came along in Brooklyn a few years ago. And then besides that, there was really not much of anything at all, but what's been really great in the last few months, you've seen about four or five breweries open up in Queens. You have Rockaway Brewing based in Long Island City. You have, uh, oh gosh, there's, an, there's a kombucha brewery in Astoria. And then you have Single Cut, which is actually New York's newest and biggest brewery too. And so they are gonna hear to pour samples to everyone, so. What's your favorite beer? Oh gosh, that's a question that everyone always gets. You know, the, the easy dumb answer is like whatever's in front of me, but if I'm going to be drinking all day long, I usually go for a nice, like, crisp Pilsner or something like that. Uh, I like uh, Victory Prima Pils, which is really crisp, fresh, low alcohol. And also the secret weapon at Trader Joe's is Trader Joe's actually, their house brand, Mission Street, is actually made by Firestone Walker. And if anyone knows Firestone Walker, they're actually one of the, the world's best breweries. And so you are get, I mean, their beers win medals every year at the Great American Beer Fest, which is kind of the Olympics of beer. And so... <laughs> You're talking, you can get that for $6.99 in a six pack there for that. And it's like 4.6%. And so I often drink that at parties. That's kind of, it's awesome. Well, well on that same topic, like, why do you not see more consolidation? Like, I'm always surprised that some of these, like, bigger breweries <coughs> acquire, like, someone like a Stone seems like a really good partner. Like, why are they not buying the Uh, I mean, you, gotta, you have to, you have to, well, uh, yeah, I know Goose Island is like the one that you have to, of. you have to sell, you have to want to sell sure. too. And so, you know, I mean, it's like if you've built up this project from the ground up, I mean, it's your baby, it's your dream, it's your life. And I mean, it's your identity is wrapped up in it. And so, I mean, Goose Island was a thing where Goose Island was a big Chicago brewery, been around 20 plus years. They got bought by Anheuser-Busch recently. And so what ended up happening was, but you can say on one hand that there are sellouts for doing it, but on the other hand, it was run by a family that worked for 20 plus years and they wanted to try something new. And so they got, they got paid a fair value and the son went on to run a sort of cider company and the dad got out. Yeah, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed how much people hold it against brewers. You know, craft beer is such a nebulous term nowadays. Yeah. You know, that, yeah, that's such an interesting thing. Craft beer, yeah, craft beer, the Brewers Association, which is kind of the industry watch group, has really been fighting the definition of the craft beer and what it means for people. And so there's really a big battle about, about what to actually call beer like that. And I mean, it's just, I like to get to a place where it's just beer that you don't have to make distinctions. That's just like that. But I mean, if you think back to the 90s, it was microbrew and no one uses the phrase microbrew anymore. So you've seen it like in just a generational shift in the way that people the way that people perceive it. And what, what's interesting as well is with the craft beer is just that there used to be no differentiation that people were like, you just drank beer. And so now people that, what I've been noticing going around talking to folks, people that like their crappy beer, they're like, you know, they call it crappy beer. Like, oh yeah, I'm drinking my 30 pack of like Bush, I'm drinking my crappy beer. And you would never call it crappy beer before. It was just, it was just beer. So there's this, this cut in the marketplace the way of people are thinking about actually how beer is perceived. And so if I don't know, oh, but definitely, like how to call craft beer. That's uh, people are fighting about that. They will always. So. Are we seeing anything on like uh, breweries like McKellar or like anything as opposed to just gypsies that travel around and use those as equipment? 
I, and here's something. So basically, there's this concept in craft brewing about gypsy brewers, which I wrote about in Brew Awakening. But anyway, so but what happens there? So opening a brewery costs millions of dollars. I mean, costs tons of money, and that's you're basically sinking. You're, you have to take out a bank loan, so you have to do everything, and like you can easily go broke before even brewing your first beer. And so the thing about breweries is that they operate best like airplanes. Like the more they they should be used as frequently as possible to the fullest capacity. And so for people, breweries have excess capacity, it behooves them to um, to rent out their extra space. And so gypsy brewers have kind of um, they're finding this loophole where they're able to go on these systems without actually investing in a big brewery, but they can go there and brew the beers. And what I think it allows them to have a lot of freedom to make the beers they want to do without having to, you know, you can try a one-off batch, you can do something, and it allows for, um, it allows for a lot of excitement. And a lot of these gypsy breweries, they, they do dozens of different styles, travel around the world, do a lot of collaborations. And I think, I personally love it. What was interesting, Yeppi from uh, Evil Twin, we are uh, basically, he's actually, he moved to Brooklyn actually, all the way from Denmark to there. And he's actually starting, going to be contract brewing out of uh, Connecticut. So you're seeing some of the gypsy brewers take root because after a while, trying to find space and always trying to find that, I mean, that's, it could be a full time job trying to juggle capacity issues. And what's to say if a brewery gets big, they can be like, you know what? I can make more money selling my own beer than running out this space to you. So at its best, a gypsy brewer is like, a, it's a tenuous proposition that could collapse at any minute. It's going to be short term. It, yeah. Thing. You got to get in, get out, and like you have to have distributors set up and distributors that can pick it up from all these breweries. Which, if you're working with great distributors like McKellar and Evil Twin, are you can deal with it. But if you're a smaller person, you know you have to selling the beer is a, is the biggest thing, and you have to have people that are going to sell it for you. You can't just go into a brewery and do it. Where do people think about the beer? What are you guys drinking? I will say, you know, a lot of, um, you're going to see it. There's a lot of custom one-off batches in New York City. Um, Six Point and Brooklyn Brewery do a bunch of stuff for the Danny Meyer, Danny Meyer chain. It's pretty common. It's a way for them to, um, it used to be if you wanted to have your own brand on there, you would just buy a really crappy beer and just call it like your house beer or something like that, which, but nowadays restaurants are really seeing a, a viable, you know, you want to give your customer the best experience possible. So you're finding that it's pretty commonplace nowadays. If you dig down, like, you know, Shake Shack, yeah, Shake Shack's got their, got the beer from Brooklyn Brewery. Um, and I think Brooklyn Brewery did some stuff for uh, Thomas Keller's restaurants, too. And so this is pretty commonplace all across the country now you're going to find. And it's a great way to do a different beer. But as far as for, like, a wedding or something like that, you know, you have to register all these brands. So it depends, depends what every state's got different registration fees. And so most people are not going to brew a beer for your wedding, unfortunately. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry. Um, right. So you, met, you sort of hinted at the um, beer distributor network yeah. thing, which um, I heard there's an interesting article recently claiming, well, it's really baroque and high barrier to entry, and, but it was saying it also helps protect um, the distribution channel for small breweries. Uh -huh. If we didn't have the regulations with all these distributors, that it would really be harder to get your beers into the stores. But of course, beers to entry are often bad. So, uh -huh. especially if it's a small beer. Do you think it's like good or not? All you have to do is watch where the lobbyist money is coming from. It's not coming from the little guy. Oh, so the barriers entry can be, you know, the barriers entry to get your, to go within the distribution chain can be really crazy. One of the great things is for smaller breweries, you're able to do, I think it's up to, I can't remember what it is in New York, where you're able to self distribute up to a certain amount. So you get to bypass that. And so, Ideally, once you grow big enough, you'll jump into that chain because, you know, distributing beer yourself gets you more money per keg and all that, but you also got to distribute it yourself. And so you have to figure out what the best use of your resources are. Is it getting in a truck and driving beer someplace or is it paying someone else to get in a truck and drive it someplace? And that, but I really believe if your distributors are snapping up brands left and right because they want to have variety, they want to have scope, they want to have, they want to have the hot new brand in New York. And I mean, especially in New York City, I kind of think of New York as kind of a weird show pony city that we do have 8 million people in town, 19 metro area, 50 million tourists coming through, and you can reach a lot of eyeballs with your brand if you get your beer into New York City. I mean, and people, yeah, what Mark was talking about, we're out till 4 in the morning. People come to New York to go out and enjoy themselves, and so, I mean, it's a market where you push a lot of beer. And the other interesting thing about the New York City market, though, is that, you know, 
we're not really a, a town that buys beer and goes home as much as we drink most of our beer out in public. And so with the city as our living room, the bars as our living room. And so that's really been a big, um, a lot of brands that come with New York City, it's kind of a rude awakening that they're not going to sell beer in bottles as much as they're going to sell beer on draft and in growlers. So. Oh, Sorry. I'll answer your question first. No, I don't homebrew. I know, it's like I'm a terrible person. But, um, <laughs> but you know what? I, I've been doing these homebrew tours for three and a half years now, and everyone's always like, why don't you homebrew? I'm like, do you know how much of my days to beer? And it's like, I have a very lovely, tolerant wife. But you know what? I spend all my days writing about beer and food. And like, end of the day, I just, I just don't have it. And it's just like. One more thing. It's like one more thing. It's like I want to relax and have a beer. But you know what? I've homebrewed with friends before, and it's great and awesome, but I just i am not doing it right now. So, But if it does. It makes me seem like a bad person to some people. Like, you're not really authentic. <laughs> it, it truly is. That things are like, it's wild. I mean, but I'm always like, does everyone that writes about spirits make their own bourbon? Do wine writers crush all their own grapes? But it's kind of like I think that it's just because homebrewing is something that everyone can do that people expect you to do it too because they can do it you should be doing it and you should be doing it better than them but mm -hmm. I don't so that's one of the ways I fail all right are you ahead yeah oh I mean it's like yeah I mean I can just I can I live in Crown Heights I've been there 10 years back when it was just uh you know, your corner bodegas, you're lucky to get a 99 cent can of Coors Light, and you're just like, awesome, this great variety. To nowadays, they're stocking like Bear Republic IPAs and like really good sprouted organic bread. And I mean, it is, it's a general upswing, this idea that we people are understanding that, you know, great products don't cost a lot of money, and there's stigmas away that, you know, it's, you know, you're paying two bucks for a loaf of like Wonder Bread and four bucks for a loaf of Grape Bread. I mean, it's people are realizing that like these little luxuries really make a big difference in life. And so I think they really do go hand in hand. Oh, that's all. That's that's why I was like talking about like preaching locally drink. I mean, there's a million great beers out there right now, and I mean, there's these things they call the White Whales, which everyone goes after them. Like Three Floyds has this beer called the Dark Lord, an Imperial Stout. The Russian River's got Piney the Elder, this amazing double IPA, and you know, I mean, it's almost like a, a geek feedback loop. Like the more people like rave about, it, the more people want to get it, and everyone wants to drink it, and so. Yeah, they're great beers, but never, you know, I got this thing, like, never wait in line for a beer. I mean, that's a terrible thing. And, like, never jump through hoops for that. I mean, they're great if you can try them, and don't get me wrong, but it's just there's so many other beers out there that are worth trying, I think. Like, I, yeah, like, I did, like, I was up in Vermont, and I did get some Hetty Topper, but it was a pain in the ass to get. And I was like, why the hell, like, I'm not going to drive to the brewery 40 minutes just to get this beer. And I had to go to the uh, co-op right when they got the shipment in. I'm like, this is silly. I did it anyway, but I'm, <laughs> but I was in Vermont. I was like, I, I have to do, and it was actually a snow, it was a blizzard that day. I'm like, I have to get drunk in the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, don't, don't ever go after it. That's my, that's my advice. If you get it in your hands, great. If not, you know, there's a lot of other beers that are gonna make you really happy. A little, bit of, a little bit A and B for finding great local breweries, you know. I do a fair amount of research and I also go into my network of friends and just and check it out. I think I think craft breweries in a sense are really get a you really get a great flavor, the little brew, brew pubs in town, the great flavor of people and so you can find out so much by bending elbows at the bar. And I mean and just talking to people. So I do a ton of research before I ever get to a city. You know, I use a lot of social media aspects. I go on Twitter and I guess great for crowdsourcing suggestions and so on which I did for my trip to Vermont. And then also it's like I reach out to brewers and I know and ask them like what's worth seeking out there. And so, yeah, I think, it, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I, my trips now are basically beer and food based, which is not a bad thing, but I try to like round it out a little bit. But I really, it is, it's so exciting to go to these new cities and try all the beers and I wanna, and it, it really just gives a great scope of what's been happening across America and I really enjoy it. Like beer, beer tourism is growing by leaps and bounds everywhere. And I think, I mean, 
cities that are smart and are doing a great thing, like having ale trails that are doing, you know, and gosh, Vermont, you can get a punch card for all the breweries you should go to. Same thing in Portland, Maine, Oregon. I mean, beer tourism is really, it's an awesome way that things are going. I feel bad, I don't have a beer in my hand and everyone's drinking around me. This is like, this is like the exact opposite of how things usually are. Uh, I'll start with the uh, Olympic White. Thank you so much. What? I know, we got them. Oh yeah, if anyone hasn't, if anyone picked up a book and saw, we actually have a, uh, we'll do with that. Which actually the cover comes off, becomes a map, so. Look at that. Oh, the cover comes off and becomes a map. Like that. And so the idea was, it's this company called Pop Chart Labs. And Pop Chart Labs, they basically do all information-based hierarchical charts like this. And so they were the ones who designed the cover of the book as well. And they've done a previous version of this map. And so we're really trying to find a way to maximize uh, space on the book. Because this day and age, I mean, we'll be honest, if you're going to make a printed product, you should have something that's going to be something you want to hold that's going to be a bit more permanent than just another thing. And, and so design was such an important thing for us on the book. And so we tried to maximize every last inch. And so what we did was these are basically all the beers that I, I wish we could do the entire chart, but you only have the uh, upside down part of a uh, book cover. But it's basically my favorite picks and styles and how they kind of uh, go to one another. And it was a really, I will tell you, I about went crazy making this with the guy. And it was just, it was not fun, but <laughs> but at the end, because I, I, it was like totally crazy jibber drabble scrabbling, and I was like trying to show him what to do and where to go, and I was like, yeah, it was not fun. But in the end, it turned out great, and I'm very happy about that. But was, yeah, the book actually won um, at the New York Book Show Awards. It won like second place for um, graphic design, so which was something really rewarding. And people are like, I like the fact that it has pictures in there, and so I didn't realize pictures were such a a boon for people. I don't know if that's just making people good or bad. I was like, I wrote all these words, but you really like the pictures. That's, that's great. <laughs> oh, my beer bar in the city? You know, I'm a cheap bastard. Like I was saying, I like beer craft because you can buy a growler or a beer and then you can share with people. And it's like, as far as in the city, beer bars I like going to. Um, you know, Blind Tiger is nice, but I can never actually get in there, and I don't like, you, it's always so crowded on that. Gingerman? Yeah, I don't like Ginger Man at all. Rattle and Hum's okay, yeah, if you're nearby. Um, other thing, Barcade's still a classic, I think, for that. And then, because I live in, like, that neck of the woods, sometimes I'll go over down to, like, 4th Avenue, go to Pacific Standard or Mission Dolores, which are over there in Park Slope. And those are actually, where that 4th Avenue, like, no man's land. Yeah, the gate's good, too. I've been to say swiggers, that's nice. But you know, living in Brooklyn, going up to our east side for a beer. Oh, so easy for you, for me, I got it. Cause I work out of my house, so it's like Upper East Side for a beer is not exactly my uh <laughs> We got a pony bar too. You got a what? A pony bar. Oh, pony bar is open up to you. Yeah, pony bar is great as well. And that's the thing, I mean the fact we can have a discussion about what great beer bars there are in New York City is I think I mean it used to be ten years ago, it was like the gate, blind tiger, I mean Ginger Man and a few other places, but it's just been, things have been going in gangbusters in such a great way that, I always liken to New York City, sometimes they get behind in certain fields, but New York City always plays catch up in a big way. So I think that's where you're gonna see craft beer really take off here, that you're gonna see so many bars popping up. And I mean, I, mean, I can't even tell you how many new projects are coming online. The folks behind Heartland just opened up a new brew, a new brew pub over on West Houston Street a couple days ago where they're brewing a new lineup of beers specifically for that. And so, yeah, the, it, that's hard, that's the Heartland Diner thing that's Heartland Brew Pub, yeah, chain. But those are more, Heartland Diner, they, they, they like the Heartland Brew Pub chain. It's your neighborhood stuff too. Yeah. That, okay, I think I know which one that is. Yeah, there's a bunch, there's like six of them. They're like in touristy, like South Street Seaport, Times Square stuff. It's just one of the few ones that's not so overtly touristy based, so. Yeah, but it's every, like every week a new thing pops up. And we're going to see a ton, more, a ton more breweries coming online too this year, I think. Especially within the uh, New York, not just in New York City, but around in Long Island. Breweries coming in, upstate New York, they're going to be coming into the city. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty great time to be a craft beer fan in New York City, let me tell you.